hope everybody's doing okay. If you weren't doing this well, when you get to come in and see those kids, that all makes everybody feel better. So we appreciate all that gets done in this class and Dave, the efforts that you've led in our class to make this the most I think she said that ever had. So that's great. We'll remember those that are sick. We've got some that sound like they're pretty sick. We're glad that some of you keep going and still having birthdays. And so, Graham, happy birthday. And then, who else had birthdays? Somebody else here had a birthday. I don't think there's She's here. not here. She's dead. Yeah. You know, John, uh, John Stewart's right. Uh, they, there's little that's spontaneous about these lessons. Uh, I have known preachers, especially Baptists, that would say that they never prepared their sermons, that they always depended upon God to give it to them when they stood up in front of the congregation. A lot of them sounded just like that. <laughs> uh, I had a buddy in, high, in, in college in Tennessee Wesleyan that had a little church. and He said that he always reserved about an hour in the shower every Sunday morning. That's where he was told by God, you know, what he was supposed to preach about. So I say that to say this, this one's got too much time involved with it, John. And so uh, I, I, I hope that you get as much out of this as I have. Let's put it that way, okay? Uh, I am about to turn over two million miles flying on Delta. That, that's not even a claim. <laughs> uh, they will send me a, an additional piece of luggage. <laughs> the, the last thing you need, frankly. Uh, I have about 500,000 miles on Southwest in addition to that. So the way I figure it, I have essentially orbited this planet about 100 times on that planet. <laughs> Uh, there are elements of that experience that I just do not like. Uh, airports and getting around in them are terrible. Something can go wrong on the back side of the moon. It'll affect your flight on a perfectly clear day. Uh, they, they, they overcrowd these things to get one more row of seats in and a little more money in their pocket. And I guess I can understand that. But boy, that can really be uncomfortable at times. I, I'm glad as I have aged that... Uh, uh, upgrades have become more possible and more likely. Uh, although it's not unusual in Chattanooga to be number 30 on the upgrade list. There's so many Delta people in Chattanooga. Uh, but I, I, I like to fly. I've always been fascinated with airplanes. And what I like the most is when that airplane taxis out and gets down to the end of the runway and starts to go down that runway and gather speed, and then there's that moment of lift. And, and that experience has remained exhilarating to me. I guess part of the reason that it remains exhilarating is because if that doesn't happen, there's going to be trouble <laughs> somewhere along the way. Uh, but that moment of lift has always been the most interesting feeling to have as you begin to soar up into the sky. And so I was intrigued recently that I came across a book entitled The Moment of Lift. And I will tell you that it's the best book that I have read in two or three years. And so I have never been the kind of person that stood up here in front of you and said, now here's a book you need to read. But if you're looking for something to finish out your summer reading program like these kids, You'll get that book, The Moment of Lift. I believe, knowing you, that you'll find that as exhilarating, as important as, as I did. That book is written by a young woman named Melinda Gates, and you know her. She is the wife of Bill Gates. But I don't think that's the way that their relationship is explained anymore. I think it's explained now that Bill Gates is the husband of Melinda Gates. And if you ever have a chance to see both of them talk together or be interviewed together, then you begin to understand, as a lot of us men understand, that the real smarts in the family are Melinda. And so Melinda Gates talks about, in her book, The Moment of Lift, not taking off in an airplane. That's just my analogy. 
she talks about the way that there can be moments of lift that occur in people's lives that are transformative. And she talks about how the foundation that she and her husband have founded, a foundation that's been so successful uh, that people have given literally billions of dollars to support its work. A foundation that's been so successful that even Warren Buffett, maybe the richest man in the world, has taken all of his accumulated wealth and has given it to them to be able to spend in their philanthropic types of activities uh, across the world. And so you ought to go read The Moment of Lift. And if you do, I think that your most memorable section will have to do with a woman in India who is called Sister Suda. Her full name is Sister Suda Bagazi. And I'll bet you that before it's all said and done, she will become the Mother Teresa of the next gener generation. We learned in school, uh, all of us did, that in India that they don't have upper class middle class and, and all the kind of things that we have sociologically and demographically in America. They have a caste system. We learned about that very early on. And we learned at the very bottom of that past a caste system that there are people called untouchables, that they are so far down in life that normal good people have nothing to do with them whatsoever and that they have not any ability to interact with normal society, untouchables. That was always the bottom floor in the way that we learned about the Indian caste system. But that's not exactly right. There's actually a group of people that are lower than the untouchables. There's a group of people that are even beneath these lowest, lowest caste. And these are called rat people. And these people, Mush Ahar, are people that absolutely live in the midst of city dumps. Uh, men and women and little children who are out there scrambling around trying to find some way to live in life. Rat people. One of the most curious things about these rat people that Melinda Gates explains in her book is that uh, they have figured out a way to not become frightened to the rats. And that instead of the rats running from them, that the rats will come to them almost like pets. And so you see these pictures of these big old ugly looking rats climbing around on these children. And in a moment you see these children smashing these rats and making stew out of them or eating them in other ways. It's the only subsistence that they have. Rat people, Mushahar in India below untouchables. Other characteristic of these rat people is that these rat people never look up. They never look up. They do that for two reasons. Number one, because they're always looking for something to eat. For something that they can find that they might sell to get something to eat. Every day is a literal hand-to-mouth existence. So these rat kids are always looking down. They look down so much that their necks grow in a way that they are bowed over that when they become older or when they become adults, you're able to pick out a rat person in a crowd with great ease if there weren't other ways to pick them out. And they also never look up because they're not permitted to look in the eyes of other human beings. Because other human beings should not have to be exposed to the face and the eyes of a rat person or a rat child, they never look up. And so Bill and Melinda Gates have founded Sister Suda's school. And Sister Suda's school in India goes into the midst of the city dumps and goes into the places of refuge where people are living. And they get little girls and they bring them out. And they take care of their health care needs. And they take care of their fooding needs. And they take care of their clothing needs. And they begin to take care of their educational needs. And they begin to transform their lives. And there are amazing stories of what these young girls are becoming. And the way that there seems to be no verifiable way of saying that a kid raised in a really terrible way, given a chance, can't succeed and can't grow and develop. 
And the people that work with Sister Sudra say, there is a sign when we know that something's going right. There's an indication when we know that there's a tipping point that goes in the right direction. You know what it is. Those girls start lifting their eyes and looking up into each other's faces and the faces of the adults of their world and start looking up at the world beyond the rats and the refuse of their upbringing. They begin to look up. I've seen that twice in my life. I went to Alaska for a number of years and worked with the native healthcare system up there. And they would have these young women that would come in from what they call villages. We'd call them reservations or pueblos. And, and, and they would want to be nurses or they would want to be techs or they would want to work in hospitals because that was a way for them to move forward in their lives. On this tool that I used to assess people, these women that came out of these villages had the worst assertiveness scores that I have ever seen. They were incapable of being assertive. And you knew the women from the villages immediately because they never made eye contact. They always looked down. And there was a reason for that, of course. They lived in those villages in cultures that were highly patriarchal. They lived in these villages where the only people that were supposed to speak were the men. They lived in these villages in which women's lives were totally disvalued. But you knew that there was a transformation that was coming whenever you begin to see them lift up their eyes and look up their faces and look at other adults in the face when they would speak up in meetings, when they would talk to men doctors. And then you saw those scores become as strong about being assertive from the inside of who someone is as they could possibly be. You could see it happen when they lifted up their eyes. I worked in a program in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is a long way from Alaska. Worked in a program that was supported by Yale that after we had this great economic downturn of the early 2000s, Bridgeport found it as a place that people were losing their jobs. And a lot of these people that were losing their jobs were middle-aged adults. A lot of these people were college-educated adults that didn't know where they were going to turn. And you'd go in to meet in the initial stages of this program that Yale was providing, and these people wouldn't look up. They were humiliated by the disasters that had occurred in their lives. They were embarrassed by the fact that they didn't have any money. They were undone because they had lost homes and sometimes lost relationships. But because of the programming that we were able to do and because of the way that Yale was able to support that, you'd begin to come in after a few weeks and you'd begin to know who really had a chance and you'd begin to know who really was going to make it because they'd begin to look up. They'd look at you in the face and they were transcending their humiliation. They lifted up their eyes. This next thing I'm going to say, Charles knows is in this lesson. It was in this lesson when I came in the door, wasn't it, Charles? Yes. See, you've had that experience too because you had that experience this morning because you had these wonderful kids that you've supported and helped in this church, in this camp, and that you've helped reach out to and love, that came in here this morning and bright-eyed as they could be, looked you right in the face and sang to you and talked to you. And all of us know that in Chattanooga a generation ago or two generations ago or before, that would never have happened in the world. And you hear this wonderful story of this young man who's gone through this camping experience having now scholarships and you've seen that extended to places across this town and throughout this country where people that have come through this program, they learn to lift up their eyes and look at themselves and look at the world and look at possibility and potential in a different way. The moment of lift, how interesting that you saw that in this room this morning. What we're talking about 
this moment of lift shows up in the Bible. It shows up in the Bible in some interesting ways that I'd like you to think about because it could also apply to our lives. It applies to somebody else that might could apply to us. Remember that story of Balaam? That's the most exciting story in my, to me in my mother's uh, Bible story book. And so Balaam is so disgusted with the children of Israel and so disgusted with the way that they're exercising their faith that Balaam is ready to prophesy against them and to help their enemies. And Balaam heads out to the enemy's camp where he's going to do them a favor and do them a, a good deed. Goes out to the enemy's camp where he's going to hurt Israel. And along the way, you know what happens? His donkey gets stuck. And in front of his donkey, there is suddenly an angel that appears and suddenly there is the presence of God and the fear of God that surrounds Balaam. And when Balaam is told to go back and take his prophecy to the children of Israel who maybe need to have another chance, that Balaam decides working for God is more important than working for the enemy. In the book of Numbers, the Bible says that Balaam comes back and that Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw the children of Israel and began to call them to God and the Bible says that the Spirit of God came upon him. In the moment of lift, he lifted up his eyes and saw in a new way. In the moment of lift, he looked at people and he saw them in a new way. In a moment of lift, people that he found a way of despising, he came to find a way of helping. And in doing that, not only were they rewarded, but he was rewarded because the Spirit of God came upon him. Wouldn't that be an interesting experience? If you look in the book of Exodus in the 13th, 14th chapter, Moses has led the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt. And they've got down to the edge of the Red Sea. And suddenly they feel they're trapped. The Bible says in the, <coughs> the book of Exodus that the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. <coughs> that the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And they saw the Egyptians coming in their chariots and with their infantry and with their horsemen. They lifted up their eyes and they saw the Egyptians. They saw what was bad. They saw what was negative. They saw what was obviously awful to them. And they began to fret and complain and they began to cajole Moses and they began to say, it would have been better for us to be slaves back in Egypt making bricks and be stuck out here about ready to kill. Be killed. And the Bible says that God said to Moses, lift up your rod. And Moses lifted up his rod and he lifted up his hand and the attention of the people went in another direction and suddenly they see a way of escape dividing out in the waters before them and they make their way to safety through the Red Sea to the other side. That was a moment of lift. And when that moment of lift occurred, it was like people quit looking in the most negative directions and quit looking in ways that only made them fret and complain and cajole and argue and belittle. And they began to see, when their eyes lifted up, a way of escape the moment of lift. We know that some of the Psalms were written by David. And we know that a few times that these Psalms come when David feels his life is in great jeopardy. And one of the most beautiful Psalms, and you know it by heart, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. David experienced that moment of lift, even in times which were probably fraught with the greatest danger. When he lifted up his eyes, he knew that the help of God was nearby. 
maybe we get in times that are desperate and dark and dangerous and anguished and awful. If we lift up our eyes, we can see beyond all that, and maybe we can know that the help of God is nearer than we might ever believe it would be. This entire theme was captured in the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms we read, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory might come in. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up. Lift up our eyes. If we experience the moment of lift knowing that God is with us, then we'll be lifted up. And we'll be lifted up in ways that we don't get caught up so much in the rats of life and the refuse of life. And we're allowed to see other people in different ways, ourselves in different ways, and our world in a different way. Now, everything that I've just pointed out in the Old Testament is mirrored in the New Testament in a powerful way. Listen to this carefully. Maybe it'll give you a different way of thinking about a section of Scripture. There comes that moment in which Jesus takes some of his disciples up to a high mountain. It wasn't just any high mountain. It was a holy place. It was a holy place that had been designated as a site where people could likely come in touch with God in the religion of Israel for literally hundreds of years. And so it was a place that was fraught with tradition, it was a place that was fraught with all kinds of different histories. It was a place that was filled with so much of their political and religious and national culture. And the Bible says that while they're up on that mountain, suddenly there is an appearance of Moses and Elijah and Elisha, three of the greatest figures of their whole history. That was supposed to be what happened on holy mountains. And it was such a transfiguring experience, and I bet we'd have been the same way. Those disciples begin to say, let's just stay here. Let's just stick with this. We have arrived. Let's just build us a house here and stay. Let's just sink ourselves into the deepest depths of culture, tradition, background, history, and old faith as we possibly can. And at the end of that section, there's a really, really interesting verse. And the Bible says, and their eyes were lifted up. It was the moment of lift. And they saw Jesus only. Now, if you'll let that sink in a little bit, that is profound. Because maybe what the Bible is saying to us is, yes, there are times and places for holy mountains. And there are times and places for worshiping sites, the tabernacles that they had built there. Yes, there's a time for tradition and ways of doing things and culture and religion. But if our eyes are lifted up, if our eyes see above that, if we have the moment of lift, then we look at Jesus and Jesus only and Jesus' way and Jesus' only way. We don't look so much to the antecedents of culture and history and tradition and church and theology. When our eyes are lifted up and there's the moment of lift, we look at Jesus only. That mean they quit going to the Holy Mountain? Probably not. That mean they stop doing their cultural and traditional ways of worship and coming together in religious groups? Of course not. But it went that the primary focus of their faith and the primary focus of their religion and the primary focus of their history and their culture, the primary focus became Jesus. Well, maybe at this point the lesson would be interesting to you and you could go away saying, 
at the, in the moment of lift that we look at people that we looked at badly and we now look at them in a more positive way. That in the moment of lift that we don't look so much on what's encroaching on us and causing us to be fearful, but we look at ways of escape. And in a moment of lift that we understand that the help of God is very, very nearby. And if we could ever experience that, we'll be lifted up. That in the moment of lift, maybe old things do pass away and lots of things become new. But the lesson can't stop there. Because the lesson has to say, so what, now what? Interesting idea. Could be an interesting experience. But how does it relate to your life and mine? And Jesus tells us the answer to that. And he tells us the answer to that very profoundly in the Gospel of John. Where Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw others to me. I'll be lifted up. People will have a clarity about my way. If I be lifted up, people may come to the place of even embracing in their lives my way. If I be lifted up, I will draw other people to me. So you see where the lesson ends is in a question for every one of us. How do we lift up Jesus? How do we create moments of lift that allow us to look at people in different ways and allow people to look at themselves in different ways? What you had in front of you this morning with these kids is a good example of the answer to that. You lift up these kids from the kind of world that a lot of them have come from and they'll look at the world differently. And they'll look at themselves differently. And they'll look at possibility differently. That's lifting up Jesus. We figure out ways like Melinda Gates to go into places like India and take these rat people and make them into beautiful little girls who can learn and who can live and be healthy and their lives are changed. That's the way we lift up Jesus. The moment lift created for us in the love of God and in His presence in our lives. The moment of lift when we live our lives in a way that we lift up Jesus and people's lives are touched and changed. And of course there could only be one last statement You thought of it yet? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. That's what we need. We need to have the countenance of God lifted upon us so that His peace that passes all understanding can be part of our lives. Let us pray. <coughs> Help us, O oh God, that we might experience moments of lift. When we see above all the turmoil of life, and we find ways of escape from it, when we look at people that we've looked at sometimes in very negative ways and find ways to give them other chances and look at them anew, give us moments of lift when we understand that as important as old customs and traditions and religions and cultures are, that what is most important is when our eyes are fixed on your Son alone. And oh God, then help us that we might be people who create moments of lift. Just like we have for these children that were here today. And may we find ways to do that Additionally, in our communities, in our homes, in our world. May our focus be not on how we put down and isolate and remove from our eyesight. But may our focus be on how we lift up 
and restore and raise so that people can look themselves in the face and look us in the face and look the world in the face and see new ways for their lives. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Thank you.